Welcome to Slate Church Online. We're so glad that you've joined us. We pray that wherever you're watching this from, that this message will bless you. If this message impacts you in any way, we'd love to hear about it. Send us an email to mystory@slatechurch.com. Why don't you guys turn to 47 people and tell them it's great to see them this morning as you find your seat. Fantastic. Well, if you guys don't know me, my name's Nate and uh, my wife Emily and I lead our family ministries here at Slate Church. All of our kids and youth programming uh, is fantastic, and we just have the privilege of doing that under our incredible lead pastors, Luke and Victoria Becker and Brandon Emma Richardson. I just want to start off by thanking them. You know, not just for the opportunity to step up on a platform and communicate to you guys, but really for their leadership, their mentorship, their guidance, their support, uh, their coaching. I think these pastors that we have are people who really walk the walk. You know, they're people that I've had the privilege of getting to see day in and day out, living out their faith, pushing forward God's kingdom, and always being willing to step out in faith and step into everything that God has called them to. And it's so cool because what we have here, a thriving, growing church where people are being cared for, where people are being healed, where God's showing up and moving and releasing people, so much of that is because our pastors are willing to, uh, you know, just take that step of faith, to open themselves up, say, hey, God, use me. And then God was just able to move through that and actually, you know, create something that I think is really special happening here in Waterloo. You know, a real move of God that just gets me really, really excited. Come on. We're part of such a fantastic church, aren't we? Come on. And I really believe it's a privilege to get to speak in front of a group of people like this. You know, it's a privilege to get to speak in front of an engaged group of people, to stand before a church that's passionate and expectant, to stand before a church that knows that they serve a God who loves them and cares for them and sent his son to die for them and wants to see the best for them and, is, and actually wants to pour something into them today. You know, that we're, I get to stand before a group of people who know that they serve a God who doesn't want them to leave this place the same way that they came in, but wants them to leave this place changed and, and fueled up and recharged and ready to step into everything that he has for them. And if you're new here this morning... Uh, as Jared said, we just want to say a huge welcome to you, and uh, we just want to invite you to come along with us. You know, have some fun. Take a cue from the people around you. Get a little rowdy. Get a little bit noisy. Really lean in, because we believe that whether you even believe in God or not, honestly, whether you even believe what we believe or not, uh, I really believe that God uh, has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you, and whether you're still skeptical, maybe you have a few questions, I really believe that he has something he wants to say to you this morning, uh, that he wants to speak to you, and he wants to move in your life. All right. Is anybody else excited for what God's doing in this place this morning? Amazing. If you have your Bible here today, uh, whether you're a good Christian with a paper Bible, or if you're a heathen like me who uses an app, why don't you turn to Proverbs Chapter 31, verse 1. One of the things our lead pastors say on a regular basis, and it's really core to the heartbeat of our church, is that we are a Bible-believing church. You know, we're a church that believes that this is the most powerful and important book in the world. We believe that it's God-breathed and has the power to transform our lives. There's power in this book, and I'm excited to jump into it says this in Proverbs 31, verse 1. The sayings of King Lemuel, an inspired utterance his mother taught him. Listen, my son. Listen, son of my womb. Listen, my son, the answer to my prayers. Do not spend your strength on women, your vigor on those who ruin kings. Hot take right up front. (laughs) It is not for kings, Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, not for rulers to crave beer, 
lest they drink and forget what has been decreed and deprive all the oppressed of their rights. Let beer be for those who are perishing, wine for those who are in anguish. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly, defend the rights of the poor and needy. Why don't we pray today? God, I just thank you so much that you're a God that loves us and cares for us, and that you're a God that wants the best for all of your children. I just pray that as we lean into your word today, as we dive into your scripture, and uh, just really expect a lot for what you have to share with us, that, that it would just be your word spoken here today and not my own, God, that your Holy Spirit would just begin to move in this place and speak to the hearts of every individual here. We pray this in your name, Lord God. Amen. 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 If you're taking notes this morning, you can title this message, Own Your Influence. Own Your Influence. See, whether we acknowledge it or not, we all have a measure of influence in our lives. And my hope with this message is that we would clearly see the resources, the platforms, and opportunities that we're presented every day. That we would begin to acknowledge the influence that each and every single one of us has and begin to own our influence. Begin to own the spaces and places that God has placed us, overcoming the fear and anxiety and worry that we have, stepping into all that God has for us. See, growing up, there were certain moments in my life where I really started to realize and notice the influence that I had. One such moment happened when I was probably about 12 or 13 years old. See, at this point in my life, I was a skateboarder. No, no, I was a real skater boy. See you later, boy. <laughs> that was dumb. I'm sorry. Um, anyways, I was a skater boy. I lived a skate life. I took my board with me wherever I went. I could do absolutely no tricks, and I could barely stand on it more for a minute. But my gosh, did I ever look the part. And how many people know that if you want to look the part, of a real skater boy, there is one place that you need to shop. And that one place is West 49. Come on, come on, people know West 49. <laughs> if you really wanna live that skater lifestyle. I did all my shopping at West 49. I was decked out in my Etnies hoodie with my baggy jeans, my Vans shoes. You know, I had the latest Quicksilver hat on. I think I actually uh, have a picture for you guys of how cool I used to look back in the day. Come on, there I am. I was a child, I don't know what my brother's excuse is for what he was wearing, but I was a child in this photo. I was rocking that skater lifestyle. You can take that down, please. <laughs> and during this time in my life, I had a couple of friends from church who were a year or so younger than me. And they started shopping at West 49 with me. You know, they started living that skater boy lifestyle as well. Rocking their cool decks, I guess. Uh, and for me, I just assumed they were as into it as I was. I assumed that they were real skater boys who were all about the trucks and decks and boards and grips. That's what I assumed. Until one day, my friend Tyson's mom gave me a call. And she said, hey, Nate, Tyson just wanted me to let you know that you know, he's actually like, he's not really about that skater boy lifestyle like you. I was like, this is kind of weird, but okay. She's like, yeah, like Tyson doesn't really like shopping at West 49. He's not really into that. And he was just a little worried to tell you himself and, and how you would take it. But he actually would rather wear Under Armour and shop at Sport Check. And I'm like, as a 12-year-old kid, I'm like, okay, I don't care what Tyson wears. <laughs> like, I was just blown away. I didn't care where he shopped. I, 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 had, I had no, you know, I, it wasn't like I was going to not be his friend because he didn't want to rock some dope vans with your boy. Uh, but as the oldest guy in the group, I didn't realize maybe some of the influence or the platform that I actually had in that situation. See, I didn't realize the opportunity that I had to actually make an impact on the lives of my friends. I didn't realize that my passion for shopping at West 49 uh, actually made Tyson feel like he wouldn't be cool if he wanted to shop somewhere else. And I think just like 12-year-old Nate 
didn't understand the opportunity that he had to impact the lives of his friends, many of us go through life without actually owning our influence. See, we go through life with people looking up to us, our coworkers, our siblings, our friends, our family members. We go through life with resources that God has given us that we can use to help others. We go through life with all the opportunity in the world, yet still we end up squandering the gifts that God has given us. We end up wasting these opportunities because we don't realize the potential we have to impact those around us. Jesus says to those following him in Matthew chapter 5, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Neither do people light up a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Yeah. See, we are salt and light. Yeah. We are called to be present and impactful, bringing flavor to the world around us and illuminating the darkest of spaces. Right. You might be an introvert. You might be the class clown. You might see yourself as too young or too old. You might believe you're too busy with work or too beaten, beaten down by anxiety. Maybe you feel too broken and hurting to actually have any influence today. You may have counted yourself out from the start of this message, saying he must be talking about someone else when he talks about those who have a platform. But I'm not. I'm talking to you today. Because in reality, you might be too shy. You might be too silly, too young, too old, too busy, too lazy. But there's a hope because our influence isn't actually contingent on who we are. See, our influence, the platforms we have, they aren't based on our own work ethic, our own skills, our own upbringing, our own power. See, we have an opportunity to make an impact by God's power, not by our own power. See, when we make a decision to follow Jesus, to accept him as our savior, to accept the free gift of life and life everlasting that he's given us, we are imbued with saltiness. We are given the fuel that we need to actually shine our lights. See, when Jesus left this earth, he left his Holy Spirit on the earth. And through the power of the Spirit, we have been, been given the resources, the gifts, and the abilities with which, with which we can make a difference. See, Paul, the author who wrote most of the part of the Bible that looks back on Jesus' life, he was writing a letter to, uh, to an early church uh, uh, in a place called Corinth in the Bible. And he said this to them. He said, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one of the manifestations, for the Spirit is given for the common good. In this place this morning, we have artists, administrators, encouragers, counselors, teachers, and entertainers. See, each and every one of us has been given gifts and ability, resources and opportunities. We have been equipped by God through his Holy Spirit to live out our purpose and work towards a common good, God's kingdom here on earth. We have the tools at our disposal, the resources and gifts from God, yet so often we still squander this influence. We get distracted and miss the opportunities God has given us. We get lost in our own self-interest and our pursuit of comfort. Or even worse, we actually abuse the power that we've been given. And it's so easy in this life, with everything that we have, with all the opportunities for comfort and distraction, with all the insecurities that we face, with all the selfish desires that exist in our world, to actually get caught up in it all. And to miss out on our opportunities. And to squander what God has given us. So how can we be a people that own our influence? 
How can we be the kind of people that step into everything that God has for them? I believe that the passage that I read at the beginning of this message can help with that. See, Proverbs is from part of the Bible that looks towards Jesus coming. It's a collection of wise sayings and teachings. And uh, most of it's actually written in short, bite-sized statements of wisdom, except for a few chapters. And this one's included in it. The chapter, uh, the excerpt that we read, uh, is actually a wise poem passed down from a queen, uh, a mother, to her son who's a king. And it's a piece of wisdom that's given in the context of his responsibilities, of who he was. You know, he was a powerful ruler of the day. He had influence and authority in the context and spaces that he was in. He had influence over the nation, and, and this mother is actually giving him a, a poem to help guide him and give him wisdom and understanding in how to wield and carry that influence. And although most of us in this room I don't think are ruling over a nation or a kingdom at this point in time, I think we do all have similar responsibilities and duties. And I think that anyone, I think that anyone who could be tempted to ignore or abuse the authority that God has given them can learn something from the wisdom this mother passed down to her son. So let's go back to this passage and see how we can apply it. The sayings of King Lemuel an inspired utterance his mother taught him. Listen, my son. Listen, son of my womb. Listen, my son, the answer to my prayers. Do not spend your strength on women, your vigor on those who ruin kings. It is not for kings, Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, not for rulers to crave beer, lest they drink and forget what has been decreed and deprive all the oppressed of their rights. Let beer be for those who are perishing, wine for those who are in anguish. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. See, there are three distinct instructions contained within this poem. This mother warns her son about the influences of women, of wine, and of the power of his words. And I think that each of these instructions is an opportunity for us to learn how we can better own our influence in our lives. See, first I want to jump right into that warning about women, the hot takes that come right up top in this uh, scripture here. Because honestly, that's what first you know, caused me to, to even look at this, at, this, uh, at this passage. I was reading through my Bible, and, and the first couple parts of it, I was like, what the heck is going on here? Like, I don't know if this, this is offensive. Like, this might, this might offend somebody. What, what's happening here in the Bible? And, and then wanted to dive in and study it deeper and uncover uh, what, what this wisdom actually was that, 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 that's contained in it. it. And I really think that, uh, that we can learn a lot from this. It says, do not spend your strength on women, your vigor on those who ruin kings. And I believe that this wisdom can teach us that if we want to own our influence, we need to invest in the blessed. We need to invest in the blessed. Initially, one might look at this and decry it as sexist, but we need to understand the context of what's happening here. This is a king. And in the ancient Near East, uh, a king like this would have had a harem, or a group of women made up of multiple wives, concubines, daughters, and slaves, who would have had like their own separate wing in his home where they would have lived, uh, and they actually would have traveled along with the king at different times. And the queen mother who's speaking to him likely would have been the one overseeing this harem, kind of managing it, organizing it, and uh, taking care of the women that were there. And so this advice in this context is actually uh, the context of a king with multiple wives. And it's actually speaking about the king investing his time and energy in pursuing multiple marriages. You know, it's speaking to a king who'd be investing his time and energy pursuing uh, uh, relations with multiple women, some of whom weren't even his multiple wives, which is already not a great place to start. <laughs> And frankly, like, I've been married for just over a year. I'm, no, I'm not going to, it's not going to be too bad, trust me. Uh, 
but I've been married for just over a year, and I can already say that it takes hard work, but it's worth it in the context of what God has blessed, you know? Hard work is worth it if it's something that God has actually said, yeah, this is a good thing. This is blessed. A marriage between one man and one woman, yeah, I've blessed that. Pour your hard work into it. Go through the tough times. Invest your strength and your vigor, your energy and your time into that relationship. It's going to be tough, but it's going to be worth it. But here we're seeing a king who is faced with the opportunity to invest in something that isn't blessed by God. Multiple marriages, pursuits of other women, living a life that is, it actually, uh, the language that's used in this piece of scripture actually uh, is meant to infer that it's a lifestyle of pursuing these women. A lifestyle of chasing after comfort and gratification for himself. See, this is clearly something that is not blessed by God. And there is no value in investing our time, our energy, our vigor, our God-given gifts and talents in things that God has not blessed. It's tough sometimes. As humans, we have a tendency to focus on the problems around us. See, we begin to gravitate towards the loudest, most negative voices. We begin to invest our strength and our resources into these black holes that drain us. I'm speaking to you people who get in political fights on Facebook right now. Uh, I'm speaking to you people who are investing your time and energy in relationships that you know you're not, you're not actually allowing to be blessed by God. In relationships where you're actually taking steps actively outside of God's plan for that relationship. See, I'm talking to the people here who are still investing in the things that they know are going to draw them back. They're still investing in the things that they know God has actually, when they know that God actually has a better plan for them. I know for me, I've had some experience with this. I think one of the trickiest times to know where we need to invest ourselves is when we have opportunities that look like the right kind of opportunities. They look like the right kind of opportunities, but they're actually the wrong kind of opportunities. I remember a time in my second year of university. You know, I had uh, partied a little bit in my first year. I had gone through some debauchery and some, some other stuff. And, uh, and I had made some friends in that time. And as I went into my second year, I started to re-engage with my faith. I had begun to come alive in Christ and see God do some incredible work in my life. You know, I was leaning into everything that he had for me. And, and, and I still had a passion and a care and a heart for the friends that I had had before. But every time I went back and tried to invest in those friends, every time I tried to pour into them, you know, and show them, you know, the amazing things that God had been doing in my life, I actually just ended up falling back into the same bad habits I had had before. You know, I wasn't actually influencing them. They were influencing me. You know, I was getting caught back up in the sinful nature that I had had before, in the temptations that I had had before, by trying to invest in these friends. And it's a good thing to bring those around us along with us as we step into what God has called us to. You know, it's a good thing to have a heart for our friends who sometimes we leave behind. You know, it's a good thing to have a heart for the people that we have, uh, we've had relationships with in, the, with in the past, even if they weren't healthy relationships. But you see, my issue is I didn't know what I needed to be investing in. See, I wasn't investing in the right thing, so I didn't have the strength to invest in other people yet. See, I hadn't invested in the blessed. I hadn't invested yet in reading my Bible and praying daily. I hadn't built up core friendships around myself that would support my faith and keep me accountable. I hadn't found the mentors for my life that would push me to pursue all that God had called me to. See, it's really easy to pour ourselves into unhealthy and negative things in life when we don't have a clear idea of what the healthy things that we should be pursuing are. See, we, if we don't invest in the blessed, we won't have strength to invest in the rest. Pastor Brandon often says to me, it's a lot easier to run towards something than to run from something. It's a lot easier to run towards something than to run from something. If we want to own our influence in this place, if we want to lean into the authority, 
the platform, the influence, and the purpose that God has given us, we need to run towards the things that God has blessed. Come on. We need to run towards reading our Bibles. We need to run towards praying daily. We need to run towards building habits of fasting. We need to run towards finding faith-filled friends, connecting with members, taking the Sabbath and rest that we need in our lives, and expanding our wisdom and knowledge of who God is. See, all these things the Bible makes clear are good investments. They are ways of surrendering to God, of leaning into Him, and opening ourselves up for Him to carry us forward. Next, I want to dive into the warning on wine. I believe that this warning can teach us that if we want to own our influence, we need to first release our resources. See, this is a warning to the king to avoid alcohol, as it causes those with influence and authority to lose their ability to carry out their duties effectively, which oppresses those who depend on them. Got that? Okay, I'll go over it again. <laughs> so essentially, what this warning is from the mother is it's saying, hey, king shouldn't be partaking in wine. King shouldn't be partaking in beer. Don't even, like, you don't even necessarily need to touch that stuff. Don't indulge yourself in it. Don't live a lifestyle of drunkenness because you have a duty and responsibility. She's saying, you know, you have a responsibility to govern. And if you're going to consume yourself with alcohol, if you're going to give in to drunkenness, if you're going to give in to chasing after your own comfort, you're going to be so distracted, you're going to be so off kilter, so disoriented, so outside of what God has for you, that you're not actually going to be able to help those who depend on what you're doing, who depend on you fulfilling your responsibilities, who depend on you owning your influence. And she goes on to say, it would actually be better just to give that alcohol away to the poor because at least then they could forget about their problems. And I think this is a little bit of hyperbole here. You know, we know that giving alcohol to the poor is actually not something that's going to help them. But the heart of the wisdom in this situation is on how we view our resources. See, the context here is that this king would have had a royal store of beer and wine. And I'm sure some of us in this place like, that would that'd be nice. Uh, but this king would have had a royal store of beer and wine that they would have had access to. They could have been drunk all day, every day if they wanted to. It was there. It was available. This resource was in front of them. They could chase after their own comfort if they so desired. But by doing so, they would neglect their duty. And the wisdom here is that instead of consuming the resources we have in front of us, instead of just using all that God has given us to chase after our own comfort, we actually need to begin to release our resources, to open ourselves up, to understand that what we have been given has not been given to us for our own satisfaction, for our own comfort, for our own temporary, non-permanent, fleeting sense of enjoyment, but it's actually been given to us so that we might bless those around us, so that we might bless those who are less fortunate. Even today, in this room, it kind of feels like I'm speaking to a room of kings and queens. You know, we're like the richest humans have ever been, especially living here in Canada. For most of history, most people have lived around the level of sustenance. They've lived around the level of having just enough to survive. It was actually only the lucky few, the kings and the queens, who rose beyond sustenance and actually had opportunities to indulge themselves in any sort of amenities or comfort. But now as I look at my own life, as I look at the way that we live here in Canada, I see opportunity for comfort around every corner. There are so many ways for us to indulge ourselves and to find comfort. You know, we have the tried and true, the beer and wine that Lemuel had in front of him. And we have new temptations, like our Netflix accounts and our podcasts. 
You know, we have temptations like pornography that's available readily online. We have temptations like fast food that we can consume cheaply whenever we want. And yes, some of these things are bad just on their own. And some of them aren't necessarily evil, but all of them are opportunities for us to indulge in our own comfort rather than lifting our eyes up from ourselves and actually looking towards the purpose and plans that God has for our lives. They all have the potential to be distractions from our calling. Come on, guys, let's not be a room full of rich young rulers. You know, in the New Testament, Jesus is walking around, and this rich young ruler comes up to him, and, and he asks him, he says, like, teacher, teacher, how can, how can I have everlasting life? And Jesus says, you have to sell everything and follow me. He's kind of like, I'm going to take a pass on that. See, the rich young ruler could not release his resources. He didn't understand the concept that everything that we actually had belongs to God anyways. You know, he didn't understand that all that we have been given, all the blessing we received, as much as we might work hard, it is not from our hard work that we have everything that we have, but it is only through the grace of God. So let's give freely. Let's approach our lives with a radical generosity. See, none of what we have is ours anyways. It's all on loan, on loan from God. Let's take a posture of generosity in our lives with everything that we have, with our money, with our time, with our energy, with our skills. Let's dedicate it all to God, releasing them to be used in whatever way he so desires. See, let's be open-handed and willing to step up and help those in need. Let's be willing to share freely and love lavish, lavishly. Let's be the kind of people who are quick to help and slow to give up on those around us. Let's embrace radical generosity as we own our influence and release our resources to the plans and purposes of a God that is so much greater than we are. Just spit all over my iPad. Just going to wipe that up there. Perfect. Finally, if we want to own our influence, we need to speak up. This, uh, this poem ends, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. After her warnings, about the women and wine, the mother in this proverb provides a final call to action. It's a positive turn in the poem that, that going from what to avoid turns to what we actually do need to do. It contextualizes the rest of the wisdom received and reveals the purpose of the whole poem. To speak up. We like Lemuel have power. We may not rule over a kingdom, but in our own ways, we all have opportunities to influence and impact those around us. We each have a voice. Why don't we use it? Let's not hold our tongues when we see injustice. Let's not stay silent in the face of suffering. We are called to use the gifts the resources and the platforms we have been given to bring about a common good, to bring about God's plan for this earth, his kingdom here on earth. Let us invest in the things that are blessed. Let us be open-handed with our resources and let us throw aside fear, speak up and intervene on behalf of the voiceless. The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. in his speech in Selma, Alabama said, a man dies when he refuses to stand up for that which is right. A man dies when he refuses to stand up for justice. A man dies 
when he refuses to take a stand for that which is true. It's crazy. We know a man that already died. See, Jesus was fully man and fully God, and he laid down his life in the loudest act of defiance against death and destruction this world has ever seen. He sacrificed himself so that we might come alive in him. And as we come alive in Christ, I feel like our only natural response needs to be to speak up. He's given us a voice so that we would use it. He has given us resources so that we can help those around us. He has made us the salt and light and filled us with gifts and talents so that we might reach those who do not yet know him, so that we might reach the oppressed, so we might be there for the needy. See, we serve a God of justice. We serve a God of truth. We serve a God of love. A God who has given us the opportunities and resources to have an influence in our workplaces, in our classrooms, in our families. As we walk down the street, whatever sphere we find ourselves in, whatever place and context that we occupy, we have been equipped and empowered to own our influence. We have been given the opportunities to step out, to reach out, to offer a helping hand, to share a kind word to encourage those around us, to teach others, to support others, to care for others, to be generous with everything that we have. Let's go above and beyond in our workplaces, in our kids, in, in the way we invest in our kids and our marriages. Let's go above and beyond in making ourselves available to those who are struggling. Let's go above and beyond and let's speak on behalf of those without a voice. What a privilege it is that the God of the universe would include us in his, plan for, in his plans for humanity. What a privilege that he would give us these opportunities to have an influence and to make his name famous. Let's not squander that. Let's own this opportunity. Let's own our influence. Why don't you guys stand with me today? As we close, I want to pray for two groups of people. First, I want to pray for anybody in this place who does not yet know Jesus. Maybe you haven't ever experienced a God that loves you, that sacrificed his son for you. A son who rose back up from the dead, defeated death so that you could have life everlasting. If that's you today, if you've never made that decision, we just want to provide you an opportunity, an opportunity to follow after Jesus, to have a relationship with him, and to begin a journey towards your God-given purpose. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And honestly, there's nothing magical or mystical about this. There's no special power in raising your hand. The Bible simply says that those who confess with their mouths and believe in their hearts that Jesus is their Lord and Savior, that he died and rose again to save them, and that they're ready to follow him, those who believe it in their hearts and confess it with their mouths are saved. So we just want to give this opportunity in a second. I'm going to count to three, and you can just raise your hand just to declare, hey, I'm making that decision today. I'm believing it in my heart. And then we're all going to pray together as a group so you can declare it with your mouth. So with everybody closing their eyes and bowing their heads, we don't want anybody seeing you make this decision. We don't want this to be a manipulative moment or anything like that. It's a moment between you and God. I'm going to count to three. And if you want to make that decision this morning, I'll just ask you to raise your hand. One. Jesus loves you. Two, he has a plan for you. Three, why don't you just raise your hand if you want to make that decision today? Awesome, I see that hand. I see that hand. Thank you so much. You can put your hands down. Wow. We're just going to say a prayer together. 
And I'm just gonna ask that everybody in this place repeats after me, just so that nobody feels singled out. Lord Jesus, thank you for sacrificing yourself for me. I know that you raised from the dead, defeating death, and I'm ready to follow after you. I have made my decision. I'm ready for life with you. Pray this in your name, Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. Come on, let's celebrate. Come on, that's fantastic. And if you made that decision today, I just want to tell you that you just made the best decision that you could ever make. And while you made that decision in private, it's actually not something that's meant to be lived out in private. It's a decision that's meant to be lived out publicly with people coming alongside you and supporting you. You see, what you just decided was not the end, just an end destination. It was actually the beginning of a new journey. And here at Slate Church, we are so excited to come alongside you in that journey, to support you in that journey, to care for you in that journey, and to resource and equip you. So Pastor Luke's going to come back up in just a minute, and he's going to have some next steps for you so that you can make sure that we can come alongside you and support you through this. Does that sound all right? Awesome. And I just want to pray for one more group of people right now before we close. I want to pray for anyone here today that feels like they need to take a step this week to own their influence. Anyone here today who wants to step out above and beyond and be intentional about owning their influence in the spheres that they occupy. So if that's you today with everybody's heads up and eyes open, because we're family here, I'm just gonna ask that you raise a hand if you wanna be included in this prayer this morning. Incredible. Why don't we close our eyes? God, I just thank you so much that you are a God that loves us and cares for us. That you're a God that, that doesn't just save us, God, but you actually give us an opportunity to be a part of your plan for humanity. You actually bring us in on the amazing work that you're doing. You bring us in on life change and let us be a part of the miracles that you're outworking in your people. And I just pray right now that as individuals and as a church, we would step up and step out and own our influence this week. That we would just be, that we would not be held back by fear. We would not be held back by anxiety. We would not be held back by inadequacy. But that we would be ready to step forward and step out and own the opportunities that you have placed in front of us. I thank you, Lord God, that you give us everything that we need to accomplish this. We pray this in your name, Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Thank you for watching. And again, if you were impacted by this message, we would love to hear from you. Send us an email to mystory@slatechurch.com. If you'd like to learn more, fill out one of our online connect cards on our website. We would love to see you in person at one of our Sunday services. And remember, follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter.